from the Whitman Foundation. so many people and obviously all of, all of these guys. Um, we are super excited about this book. Um, we were really thrilled to work with Mac, who is an amazing partner, as all of you know, um, and have this opportunity to reproduce in their entirety all eight of the artist books that Francesca Woodman made in her lifetime. Um, I should say two of those were previously unknown and discovered in her archive when we started processing it. So it's a big deal. Um, I think a big deal also because this, the nature of these books is that they're so fragile that they really can never be seen in their entirety. So there's all of this really rich material that most people would never have the opportunity to see. So when we were given the opportunity and chance to make this book, that was one of the really big draws for us. Um, she got just a little background, she, she collected found notebooks from the 19th and 20th century in Rome at flea markets in the 1970s. And she worked serially, and she um, inserted her photographs into these notebooks um, in ways that made them feel like progressions and almost like um, un, uh, like film stills, sort of emerging through the page. Um, I guess another key element of the book for us is that there's been so much written on Francesca and about Francesca and frankly put onto Francesca, um, particularly through a biographical lens that one could say could be limiting and reductive. So we were very happy to give up her voice in this project and so it was really important for us to have her speak for herself. So there's no art historical essay at the front deconstructing all of this work and telling you what it means because we didn't want any more of that. Um, we do have the luxury, though, of having our collections curator, Kevin Najernik, who culled the archive and found many things in Francesca's own words that she used to contextualize the pieces. So um, without further ado, we just thank Rizzoli so much, and we thank you all of you. We're thrilled to hear what you have to say. This is like a dream come true for us. Good evening. Hi, I'm Drew Sawyer. And I said thank you um, for the invitation for to be on this panel with three amazing artists. I, I can't believe I'm here tonight with you all um, to celebrate this new book of Francesca Woodman's work. Um, and I've admired all four artists deeply, and I had the pleasure of writing about. I was one of those art historians that wrote Sorry. an essay. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was good. Just kidding. No, it's um, good. Back in 20, 2019. Um, so, um, but you know, I'm, I'm really I'm excited to hear what you all have to say. In part because I think you know you all started your careers as artists um, when Woodman's work was being received in the 80s and 90s, and sort of thinking about the sort of critical framework again that was put on to Woodman's work, and thinking about that relationship to your own work um, uh, could be really fruitful. So I'm excited. Um, I'm going to give some really brief introductions for each. Uh, each of the panelists tonight, um, and then each of them will give a short presentation, um, and then we'll do a short discussion and open it up to the audience. Um, uh, so born in Toronto, Moira Davey is an artist and writer based in uh, New York who works in the fields of photography, film, and writing. Uh, over the past several decades, Davey uh, has, explored, um, uh, has explored personal narration and memory alongside text and influences of literary figures among uh, many other things. Um, she's the author and editor of many books, uh, including The Shabbiness of Beauty, uh, Moira Dav David uh, Peter Hujar, which was published by Mac uh, in 2021. Uh, a survey of her films was recently presented at MoMA. I hope some of you caught that. Um, and for the recent exhibition exposed at the Palo de Tokyo, she produced um, a photographic series called Visitor, which um, was inspired by the work of a, a, a French um, author and photographer, Olivier Hubert, and evokes sort of through autobiographical notes the experience of the American healthcare system. And for sure, I mean, Hubert and Woodman would be interesting sort of comparisons to even talk about tonight, if there's time. Um, Justine Curlin is known for her photographs of utopian landscapes um, and of people who live on the, often live on the fringes of American uh, society um, uh, and often staging images in collaboration with real individuals rather than models. 
Um, uh, Kerlin's recent books include Girl Pictures, which was published by Aperture in 2020, and Scum Manifesto, published by Mac in 2022. Uh, Justine Kerlin Girl Pictures is currently on view at the Wadsworth Athenaeum through September. So hopefully you have a chance to check that out. Um, I also want to just point out that Kerlin's also been organizing exhibitions of other artists' work in her studio, such as the recent uh, Silt of Each Other, uh, Genesis Bios and Jenny Glevis, and I was even thinking about their sort of relationship to Francesca's oh, yeah. work. Anyway. Um, and finally, Collier Shore is an artist and fashion photographer who's also based in Europe. Um, Shore's work often negotiates the uh, fluid nature of authorship and performance in relation to portraiture. Um, her, uh, Collier Shore's last show, uh, Eight Women at 303 Gallery, incorporated elements um, both from the sort of editorial fashion work into the dialogue with the rest of her work, unpacking the subjective nature of objecthood and representation. Um, I'm sure maybe some things we'll talk about a little bit tonight in, in relation to women. Um, <clears throat> Shore has been adapting uh, a film by Chantal Ackerman, uh, Je Tu Il Elle. Uh, into a ballet performance. Um, and she also has six monographs with MacBook, MacBooks. So. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna, each one will give a, a short, as I said, sort of overview, thoughts on, on women's work and their relationship, and why don't we start, we can start at this end and work our way over. Right? So, Hi, so normally I winged it, quite successfully, but um, I was thinking that I didn't want to do that with Francesca Woodman for a couple of reasons. One, that uh, I don't have a, I don't have a huge kind of ongoing connection to the work, meaning like I don't, it doesn't pain me, uh, I'm not competitive with it. I, I always kind of thought it had nothing to do with me, up until recently. Um, now I think it has a lot to do with me, and so I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, but I did want to just write some things down. So the first is just a series of questions. Who's looking and what do they see? What is it we don't know? What part of what we are seeing is a subject, and what part is all biography? Who is she playing? Who is her fantasy? Did she live her fantasy outside the photograph? Can this work be about me as a woman or just as a photographer? The first thing I want to say is that Francesca's work suggests violence and that there has been a certain familiar aggression projected onto her work. Um, I think I really first focused on it in maybe 1983, when I think Carol Squires took my class to the Francesca exhibition, which might have been at Marion Goodman. Yeah, is that possible? No, because I was in school. But maybe I'm thinking of Irving Penn. So <laughs> um, but but um, my sensations in looking at the work maybe just even in the Carol Squires essay, were varied. Um, at the time, I was being taught to shun these kinds of female characters, young, sexualized women, girls, and along with it, a lot of photography of women. I remember thinking there was a long list of cliches, but I think primarily I felt left out of the possibility. What I have come to realize is that Woodman was making sure she defined her body, her, I think I wrote attitudes, her messages, resting them from art history. Ultimately, the female body was visually attacked and circumscribed into art history by men. Men got to us before we could. So we must argue with the fear of representing. The pictures will always be different, the ones we make even if the camera lights and limbs seem the same. So for me, just uh, in the last couple of years, I've been photographing a blonde woman, um, often naked, and with myself and, and alone, and I, I remember having a conversation last year, um, kind of to calm myself more than 
the woman I had photographed me. But I had this sort of panic of the anxiety of cliché. And, you know, where were we breaking into some new ground and where were we sort of comfortable in something that we remembered seeing or doing. And, and I got kind of angry because I realized, and this is when I thought directly of Francesca Whitman, that, um, that we just didn't get a chance to represent ourselves because men have been doing it for so long. And it's particularly heinous in photography. And so when I was young and looked at that work, the things I felt were, I don't look like this woman. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a persona that's interesting to the world. I don't, I'm invisible. And so I think I had a certain amount of, not artistic jealousy, but a kind of like, why can't I be seen, right? And, and so now, like, you know, dealing with the naked body and a floor and a wall and a cup and a piece of fruit and all of these things, I realize it's really important to grant yourself permission to kind of take a whirl at it all. And that way, I think Francesca Whitman's work was um, not problematic, but really important. And, uh, you know, and, and lastly, I just want to go to Lee Miller and thinking about how, um, you know, the famous picture of her in Hitler's bathtub with the boots and stuff. In some ways, to me, that's as much about Man Ray as it is about Hitler. And it's as much about kind of moving away from just the object of the gaze to kind of talking both about your body and owning your body and also what it's like to sort of be seen as slipping into men's boots. Like, you know, and, and on that note, I want to kind of make a, a public statement that I think I'm going to avoid the male canon as a term. So from now on, I'm going to talk about the female canon. So thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I just, I just have a few little notes here on my phone, but um, basically I was going to talk about the moment when I saw Francesca Woodman's work for the first time. Uh, it was 1988. I had, um, I had just moved to New York, and um, I actually just heard Justine say before that she discovered Woodman when she was 19. I was 30, so I think we discovered her at the same time because we're 11 years apart. So I think it, it was. So there you go. <laughs> Um, I thought that was that was kind of a, uh, a great a great coincidence. Um, so uh, wait, let me get my phone here. Um, well, anyhow, maybe I don't need it. Um, I um, so yeah, so I, I had just moved to New York, and um, um, we stumbled uh, upon the Wellesley uh, Hunter Cuny um, little catalog for show, we just found it um, in a used bookstore, and um, it's just a really, you know, kind of a very modest little thing. The reproductions are not that good, they're kind of gray and flat, and but it absolutely didn't matter because the, uh, I was, I was completely, um, I was just completely, like, riveted and fascinated by these photographs and to put it a little bit in context i think i was in a bubble at the time i had just come from a mfa program in san diego i was about to start the whitney program in new york and you know the kind of um you know photo people we were looking at and talking about were like you know john baldessari and barbara kruger and 
um, you know, people who were like using appropriated, um, a lot of appropriated material. And so like suddenly here's this young woman who's putting herself, her body in the photographs. That was actually what Collier alluded to this. It was kind of taboo at the time. Like, you, it, well, you weren't supposed to do it. It was like, um, it was really, you know, um, frowned on. And, uh, you know, there were all these like writers and theorists who were uh, agitating against, you know, those, those kinds of images and photography and film. And so to, to sort of like come out of like that kind of, you know, fairly sort of dry biscuits, you know, education, and to you know, suddenly see these images that were just so um, extraordinary and, you know, just like the way she was working formally and narratively and she was influenced by literature. I, she read Jean Rees and Colette, who I had also read at the same age when I was, like, when I was her age. Um, um, so that was really interesting to me. It was clear to me, or maybe more and more clear <coughs> over the years, that she was a poet and um, you know, someone who really you know, had a way with language, that she was just incredibly playful and, and clever and agile with language and the way she used words with her photographs, you know, just kind of scratching um, words, you know, directly onto the prints. She wasn't, you know, precious at all with her work. She was, she was really messy. Um, and, you know, just sort of all these things made for, you know, just like a really compelling revelation. Um, and then the other thing, so in this little catalog are these two major art historians, Abigail Solomon Godot and Rosalind Krauss are writing about her. And like, people like that were not writing about real photography at the time. They were writing about, you know, pictures. Um, there just wasn't, a, there was no critical, well, that I was aware of anyhow, there was not very much, you know, cutting edge critical writing about someone like Francesca Woodman. So like Krauss's essay in particular, I think just like really is just, it hits it, you know, like she really, she really understood Whitman. She understood just how, how playful she was with, you know, everything that she was doing, the picture plane, flat, you know, flattening, you know, using all these devices um, to uh, create flatness within, you know, the flatness of the picture. Um, okay, now I just, I gotta open this up so I can see. I probably just have one or two, one or two more things to add here. Um, no, it's okay. Um, but I was just gonna say, let's see what else. I looked at her contact sheets in your book, Drew, and so that was, that was so interesting to me to see like how sometimes she would do like this, she would make an elaborate setup, you know, like the photograph with the cyanotype of the forks and the spoon, and she's there with like, and then she would take one or maybe two pictures and that was it, you know, she just like, she wasn't precious and that like, about like trying to get like the perfect image and I, I just like had this sense that she was just kind of moving through the world with her camera and taking these pictures with so so much ease and just kind of folding you know folding this practice into her life which was you know something that I admired greatly um, and okay just like the final thing that you know the, the level of unpredictability about her work she was you know using long exposures and uh, timers and um, and so you know she never really knew like, you know, exactly what she was getting. So like pretty much every image would have been a surprise to her and there would have, she would have, um, tra you know, transformation, she would have like been able, you know, to expect like transformation in, in pretty much every image, which is what I think um, is one of the things that's just so important for photography and film. Like if you can have that, it's, um, it's, it's a really, um, it's just such an important element to a good picture. Um, okay, <laughs> I think those are all of the, uh, oh, I just wanted to say, did I say fascination already? Oh, just like fascination. And like Roland Barthes says, 
something is fascinating precisely because you can't say why it's fascinating. And I think that's kind of true about her work, even though I've already just like <laughs> lathered on about like what I, I like so much about it. But I think that's like a key, um, something key to her work. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's fun to go last in here and decide whether or not I want to read this thing that I wrote. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to. Because um, I really appreciate, Collier, your, your, your skepticism of the work and kind of coming to it later. I think that kind of tentative way, there was so much hype around Francesca Woodman at, at a certain time um, that I found just researching for this talk and rereading these essays and really looking at the work again, that it was so different than I had imagined it was. Um, and then Moira's, um, you have such a, uh, your, your uh, I, I remember when we were talking about what we were gonna talk about and you were, you were like, no, that's, that's not who she, like you just, you, you see her so clearly, so it's really kind of amazing. Um, I guess the thing that I was going to talk about, that maybe I will, is um, is like about shame. Because for me, if I was like 19 or 20 when I when I saw her work, it's, it's coming out of a time where I'm like sexual for the first time, living on my own for the first time, dealing with a body for the first time. And I can't look at Francesca's work without feeling so much painful reminder of like what navigating a femme body meant back then. And, and really like before Google or before you, like people weren't as savvy as they are now. So just um, like I, I put myself in harm's way in ways that I think people are way smarter than I had ever been. Um, so. Basically, I was making Francesca Woodman pictures as an undergraduate, and even before I had gotten to college, I spent two years before, um, between high school and um, when I went to SVA, um, in this Lower East Side apartment that had certain light that would come, natural light that I could photograph myself in. I knew exactly where I could stand, where the, there was adequate exposure. Um, my father was a still life painter, so I would go to Chinatown, and I was really drawn to this idea of turning myself into a still life painting. So I, would, I posed myself in the most ridiculous, embarrassing scenarios with like fish all over me, or like with jelly smeared around my body, and like imagine that I was like dead. Um, and it was a crime scene um, with like caution tape, with a gas mask. The, the, the word, like talk about cliches, but like I didn't, I had no frame of reference at all, or the, the vaguest frame of reference. So the pictures I made were so unmediated. And, and, um, and when, when my teacher at SVA was like, oh, you should really look at Francesca Woodman, it was the first time I had seen a photograph, I mean, you touched on this Moira, that, that spoke to me, that was like, this is my experience of what it feels to be so deeply ambivalent to be a body, like to, to, to understanding a femme body as, um, as an object of desire, and that my value was in relationship to how I was going to be seen. Um, and so, you know, I, I had like, I had really bad sexual experiences, but I remember like a particularly like, not banal one of being in seventh grade and having someone tell a friend of mine that he could cut her head off and fuck her. Like the kind of the kind of like like younger person, like the, the way that you understand yourself in fragments and through a type of violence towards your sexuality is like it's so raw, it's so felt, it it, it was it's it was there in those pictures. And so when I saw those pictures, I was like, oh yeah, I, I am Francesca Woodman. And so looking at those pictures then, I didn't actually see how much smarter and more conceptual and hilarious and all of the things I see in the work then, because I was so locked into looking at those pictures inside of the filter of my own pain. So it's like, I, yeah, I, I like in, in preparing for this, I like pulled out a box of negatives. I was like, oh, it's like, was so cringy and horrible to like, <laughs> But it's just like, I mean, I think that's the other side of it is like what, 
how embarrassing it all is, you know? And like, and, and what, what about an art that like really makes us feel queasy? Like, what about that? And how can we stay in that feeling of queasy without like falling into these tropes or these, you know, like, I don't know, there's something really special about how good that work is compared to actually what I was doing when I was 19. And just to say also that the girl pictures that I made were made really a couple of years after that, my Francesca period, um, as, a, as a reaction against what, what I was considering an airless room and a kind of double bind of working the cage of like, that they, I had to do whatever I could to get the girls out of the room and into the world and away from this kind of overhanging frame of their own kind of self-loathing. That's kind of what that means. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, but I also have questions. But um, maybe, yeah, but I mean, we can sort of stay on I'm, both your term fascination, right? And this like idea of fascinating not being able to really describe something, right? And then you talking about ambivalence also, and, and to go back to those, that 86 catalog, right? In a way, especially at Solomon Godot, um, <clears throat> situates Woodman's work within a specific 1980s sort of feminist discourse around pictures generation, right? She mentioned Cindy Sherman and Margaret Kruger, so all artists that are thinking sort of conceptually about appropriation, so she, you know, she talks about the way in which Woodman is appropriating the sort of um, patriarchal gaze and the sort of um, history of images of, of women, and in particular, she points out um, uh, surrealist images. Um, um, but of course, right, I mean, you could, right, one could read the, the Francesca's work as a, sort of a critical work of representations of uh, women's bodies, but um, I think what you're pointing to is that there is a lot of ambivalence, so there's not one way of reading the work, and there's so many, as, as Krauss's essay shows, um, so many things that are formally and conceptually going on about just about the medium of photography. Um, but I did, I wanted to, and I, I also was curious about um, where your, specifically your notes on photography and accident, which you kind of, I mean, I guess you kind of touch upon like what you said about discovery, but I was rereading that essay and, and you bring up, right, that coming across Woodman's photographs, which were not, um, you know, self-acknowledging as construction, or is a photograph as construction. Um, but I think it's interesting because all, all of you, you know, have, Made, went on to make work that in some ways did right, uh, um, treat the photograph as a construction or identity as a construction. So I want, I, yeah, I was just curious to think about your work more in relationship to Woodman's and that uh, is very specifically around this idea of maybe um, representation or identity as a construction and how you see that or what, you know, why, I mean, I guess you kind of pointed to it that was, a reaction in a way against women's work, you going and making girl pictures in which you worked with people, but it was staged, right? And it was so clearly staged in, the, in a certain way. Um, so I don't know, yeah. Well, I was just thinking, you know, you make a photo for someone to look at, and when you're in the photo, you make a photo for someone to look at you. And, and I think those things can share territory that you know, I, I, I think the performance of Francesca in the work, and, and think about it, it's, it's years of work, right? And she died young, and it's still, say, six or seven years of work. So who she is in those pictures on any given day changes. So there's one day or one month where she's a photographer thinking about photography. And there's another day that she's a photographer thinking about photographing a woman a certain way. And then there's a day when she wants to photograph herself and say something that we may or may not understand what it was. And and I think it's that kind of you know multifaceted situation and, and happening in that time period where you know feminism was sort of attaching itself to picture making in you know in a particularly controlling way, and so I guess when I look at the work, 
yes, you know, there's shame, yes, there's violence, but there's also sexuality and desire and an awareness of one's desirability. And I don't think that that's exclusively my body exists to be used and violated, but my body has a certain kind of power. And, and I think what's so complex about women's bodies in photography is that you know, we've been sold a pretty, uh, pretty strong argument against the appearance of power in the female image. That what we look at and think, oh, that's a really strong woman, is, is a picture, usually you know, mediated by a male artist. But I do think the complication in Woodman is, is partially due to like, what's the authorship taking on in any given day? And what's the kind of, you know, what's the kind of diagram between construction and autobiography or desire and fantasy? I have a question about that. Like, as a photographer myself, you know, you're looking through the viewfinder, and how much does it say about you and the subject that you're looking at? And how do you decide to actually say, when, 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 like, how do you describe that? Like, or, you say or, click, click, click. <laughs> no, I think it's more complicated than that because you're actually having a an experience of empathy, and you're bringing this camera in front of a person when it comes to portraiture, and for them to express their vulnerability, they need to trust you. And for that to happen, it's just your presence and how you actually say, okay. And that, that's, that's super powerful. That's one story, right? That's one story. There's not like a world of empathetic photographers right now. No, but it's interesting that you're bringing that up because I think that like maybe at the, the heart of what you're talking about also is this question of how, um, we internalize a sense of ourselves. So like how we want to be pictured is like, we're not always constructing our own construction, right? Like, like I'm thinking about myself when I was 19, like I, I would like arch my back or, you know, do the certain kind of poses because I felt like that was the way that I was supposed to look good that I wouldn't do now as a 53 year old because I have a, a different sense of myself and I'm not as, um, uh, subjugated by, by those, those ideas. And so I guess it, it goes to the Francesca Woodman question, I think is, and I think it goes to those questions that you were asking in the beginning also is like, how, how was she constructing herself? Who was, who was it for? Is she in control of the images? Or is there this tyrannical gaze like weighting her down? And, and those questions are like, I think really complicated. I, I, I just think she was, she was so unique, you know, she was, she was, there was, like, I, I want to say she was sweet, sweet, generous, people are probably going to take issue with that, but, like, I had never seen work like hers um, anywhere, and I know people, like, you know, draw sort of certain lineages to surrealism and so on, but they're pretty, those threads are, are pretty thin, I think. And um, um, she was, um, yeah, she just, she had, she was just really doing her own thing. And uh, it was just so, so original. And um, yeah, like, so unlike anything, I, you know, I'd ever seen. And, um, um, but um, what was my point that I wanted to make? I think I, <laughs> I forgot. Oh, yeah. I actually can't. I, I don't even remember writing that, honestly, about what did I say that you she said? Oh, yeah. When, uh, here I have it. Yeah. Well, you um, said, um, I know photography has to evolve, and that some artists, it makes no sense to produce a photograph that is not self acknowledging as a construction but I still stubbornly cling to those artists, like Francesca Woodman, who did it without dusting the hairs in the game. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I mean, she 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 was, you know, self-consciously and playfully, you know, like uh, like what I said before, like an, acknowledging the photograph as as a construction with all of these like mirrors and you know flattening the body and um, pieces of glass and and so on. It it was and like where where did those ideas come from? They they seemed um, almost just like kind of innate sort of. Uh, um, hunches that she had about, uh, you know, like she knew she knew the medium so well. She knew what it could do, and everything that she did in in her stagings and constructions was sort of about reinforcing those. Um, so she was she was yeah she was doing her really her own thing in terms of acknowledging the constructed aspect of the photograph. It's also interesting to think about her you know, being in New York and having artist parents. You know, it's not a body of work that was made in Kansas by someone. It was a body of work that was made to be shown. It was made to be accepted. And it wasn't particularly accepted, right? Like she didn't, it wasn't just, you know, she wasn't lauded. And so sometimes when I look at the work, I, I, I can really relate to that sense of urgency, of you know, a, a kind of anger. It's not just an anger of what's happening internally in her life. It's a kind of like I want an audience. I want to be seen, and to me, that really you know can propel an artist to take a lot of chances and to really push and push and push the medium. I think that's there. I mean, one, one question I have, and I've, I've been, so she came to New York in 79. Douglas Crimp had just done the picture show in 77. He didn't publish his essay, I think, until after she died. But, you know, there was, there was that kind of, those ideas and that kind of writing were, were circulating. And I just wonder, like, was it depressing to her to know that, that photography had, that she was, you know, kind of being bypassed, you know, because all, like, all of the, um, um, you know, the kind of critical ideas around photography had, had to do with appropriation. Um, I don't know if anybody has, if any historians here know, like, was she aware of, of that new, um, body of, of criticism and and did it did it affect her? Did it like was was she did she feel rejected because she was, you know, in in like working in an older uh, tradition? Um, yeah, I mean I don't maybe somebody knows more specifically, but I mean you know her her she was family friends with the editor Mark Forum. So she did not know. With Max Kozlov, the editor of Art Forum, as a family friend. So certainly, right, she was reading Art Forum. She had access to that kind of critical discourse. Um, you know, whether she saw pictures or read his catalog or read the essay when it was published in October, yeah, that I don't know. It was really, like, during that time, I mean, I started SK in 81, and I took Cal Squire's criticism class way before I took the, an art class. I wasn't there as an artist. And you know there was tons of students in the black and white dark rooms doing street photography, and then there was you know a Semiotics class and Craig Owens class. So there were literally you know a lot of people just aware of street photography, and then a couple of people aware of Richard Prince. And and so I think during her time, it would have been you know would have been unlikely that she felt like, fuck, I'm born at the wrong time. But had she lived, she would have been born at the wrong time. But then she still, I think, with the power of the work, it still would have pushed through. But it's, it's you know, we'll never know. But I, th I, I think she did feel rejected. I, I've well, I think she felt rejected, but I don't know that she felt rejected because she wasn't doing appropriation. Safe to say, she knew she was making work that was not of the moment. She was of a different time. Yeah. And she also, she, no, but also there's letters in her archive where she talks about 
oh, I keep wanting to show, for example, the diazos that she was making for people, you know, there's dealers that she was working with that were only interested in her more traditional straight photographs, but even that she wasn't getting a lot of traction with. And then even coming back to the artist books, she wrote in a letter to her mentor, Edith Schloss, about, you know, I'm, and I think it's quoted in the book, you know, that she's, everybody says you can't show artist books and you can't make them, but I'm nothing if not stubborn. So, like, she knew and she was just doing it anyway, is my sense. I don't, I can't speculate on how she felt about it, but I think she was very aware that she was doing something that was quite different than what was going on. And even the NEA grant, she applied for an NEA grant and did not get it. Um, with, with very beautiful classical images. I think she just yeah. felt that that's what was going to be accepted. I mean, you didn't mention that it was Daniel Wolf that she was yeah. showing with, and mm -hmm. they didn't want to look at anything that was more experimental that she was doing, but she also came out of RISD with Siskind, and I mean, it, it's just a more traditional straight photo background, but I think it's safe to say she didn't feel like she fit into her moment. I think it's safe to say. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I was interested to hear you all speak about, well, there's a, maybe a couple, I don't know how, much, how we're doing on time, but um, uh, one of the other things I was thinking about in relation to all your work was, um, and especially Justine, but um, was thinking about adolescence, um, right? And the fact that, you know, women, of course, she begins making photographs as a teenager, right? And as you said, she grew up with artists for parents, so obviously she's very aware. Um, but um, also just, yeah, that, that sort of relationship between youth and women's work. And um, obviously something that runs through yours, I mean, especially with your children, but with you, you've um, made pictures of wrestlers and other youth. Um, obviously your girl pictures, which you already brought up. Um, I mean, I think the first thing that I was thinking about when you were saying that um, is how like I was talking about how when I was a student I was making Francesca Woodman pictures before I even knew I was making Francesca Woodman pictures and um, and now as a teacher I see my students who make Francesca Woodman pictures before they know who Francesca Woodman is. Um, so I think that there is really an important rite of passage that happens when you pick up the camera for the first time and you have control over how your own pictures are, are produced and you know have the power to make that picture. Although that's wildly different now that people have iPhones. So, um, you know, it probably happens at four instead of 16 or something. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of the examination of like prodding and probing, pro, probing her body and like pulling it out, distorting it, um, I think has to do with also just like having a woman's body for the first time too. Like, I mean, I've, I've like, you, you know, you have boobs for the first time and they're like, you know, they're, you have this, you have an ass, you have like things that are like fleshy and you know, you wanna feel what it feels like. You know, you practice kissing in the mirror, you like, you do, you take your shirt off and sing along to like Shade. You, like, you know, there's this thing about like kind of exploring what it is that you might, look like that is that photography has already mediated your understanding of, of who you are and so it's yeah it becomes like a real rite of passage I think. But I do I do think about your wrestling pictures and like your um also yeah I mean there's a lot of pictures of, of teenage boys. I, I I quoted you in something I was writing about um I, what did you say? It's such a good piece of writing you said yeah, it. Oh you do? Yeah. I think this is what you're Oh, yeah, if adolescents were show business, then young guys would be Las Vegas. <laughs> and that, was, that went with a catalog essay that Collier had written for like a 1990s show of, of these wrestlers that were, in a sense, surrogates for yourself, where you were casting people well, who looked like you, or am I confusing <laughs> too? I mean, when I made those wrestlers, I wasn't even sure what I was doing there. Uh, I just knew I wanted to be close to them, but just thinking about what Drew said and then what you said and talking about this female body. You know, for me, I kind of have always, up until recently, avoided my female body. And so part of, I think, making work with boys was a continuation.
interpretation of that avoidance. And what you were doing at like 16 or 17 or 20, you know, I've just been doing the last three years. So like I've been photographing the female body and prying at it and, you know, looking at it and marveling and watching it and touching it. And, and in some ways it's just like, whoa, it's such a, you know, between us, it's such a long amount of time. Um, and then thinking about Francesca and, and her sort of having, you know, being the material and being the thinker and, um, and being so alone for the most part, such a lonely endeavor. And I think when I was with the wrestlers, it was a real investigation of togetherness, of not aloneness in a way, because adolescence to me was such a lonely place. <laughs> I mean, the, the other question I had, which sort of you both mentioned a little bit, obviously, in terms of um, thinking about that tension between autobiography, which we often want to read into the pictures, right, because of course she's using her own body, um, and, but I'm, yeah, and I'm curious, again, like you've all mostly worked with surrogates, or you, right, I mean, I know you were making portraits and then really moved away from it, but actually have returned to it the only in writing and film, not really photography. Oh, no, right. so also photography. But I'm curious about that, right, that like initially dipping back into it in, in photography and, I mean, in film and writing, which obviously provide more context, right? There's more framework than a single image. So, um, yeah, if you want to speak about that sort of tension between autobiography and, yeah, use it, like other ways to approach it through the surrogate that it's not sort of I don't know. I never, I never thought of her work as portraiture or like self portraiture or autobiography necessarily. In fact, seeing this book for the first time, there's like one of them is por actually one of the notebooks is portraits. And, and I, that was like the first time that I've seen her making portraits of people. I, I, I always kind of assumed that, you know, she, you know, when she put her body in the photographs, it wasn't a self-portrait. Often her face isn't even there. It was like her body was like clay, you know. It was like just part of, she was molding her body and using her and her form as part of, um, you know, just, just, just making, an in, making an image. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I... I really, I guess I, I, I really kind of, I agree with what Chris Krauss wrote. Like I, I think she, she really kind of understood like the gist of, that it was just, you know, it was like always like these sort of playful, formal, um, you know, very, like so kind of knowing, you know, so, so intelligent, so witty and kind of, sly, you know, sort of gestures uh, towards um, just kind of using using the body for whatever she wanted to um, stage in, in a particular photograph. And, it, you know, it was, uh, it was just about, like, it was um, not only formal, but a big part of it was, like, a, like formal decisions and choices. Oh, the question, yeah, sorry, to go back, I was, I was curious, uh, to go back to thinking about, right, the way I was saying that oftentimes autobiography is read into the photographs, um, even though, right, they might not be autobiographical well, at all, but that pictures. desire to read into it, and I'm curious about the way that you, you know, seeing the pictures and then you not going that route, right, actually you sort of explore the autobiography, but through surrogate. Yeah, I mean, my work is more and more in the last years autobiographical, but, um, you know, it, it, from the very start, it was jumping off of, of, you know, an idea of wanting to have speech. So I, I would say, you know, all the work in Germany, you know, with the Nazis and the kids and the soldiers was 
very much about being a Jew and being me and going to Germany and kind of feeling compromised and then making work about that. So I would say my work is, you know, and I had to retire from being an art critic because I was just writing about myself. So I, I would say I'm definitely in the autobiographical camp, but, but I'm also in the appropriating other people camp. So, you know, sometimes I walk in the bodies of others. Still there. Mm -hmm. Is there, do you think there's still a stigma about being autobiographical as a curator at the Whitney now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, is it, is it bad? Do you mean autobiographical or no, an artist? artist. Yeah. No, I don't think so. But no, I don't. I don't think there's something bad about being autobiographical. What's well, interesting because I mean I think that was right a long for a long time, right? It was frowned upon to read even biography mm -hmm. into any artist. And I think actually what's interesting is you're seeing now museums doing shows on famous male artists that are largely biographical. They're driven by. Right. The Brooklyn Museum did a big show in Warhol and about you know his Catholic faith and sexuality. That's largely biographical, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which wouldn't be a show that a New York institution would have done probably 30 years ago because it would have been frowned upon. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the relationship between Frida Kahlo and Whitman is. Because I, I would assume she looked at that work when she was younger and she got ideas about the body and kind of, you know, things that looked both sexual and painful. And that there was this kind of, um, and, you know, huge anxiety, but also a kind of need to show a certain kind of power in your own image. Yeah, there's, there's, there's even a picture with little bits of hair cut. Um, where she tapes the hair, which is something that Frida Kahlo did, I think, in, in one of her paintings. Yeah, and I, it's, I think that's a really good uh, um, thought, and there's probably, yeah, a lot to be explored with that. Uh, yeah, questions. So now we'll open it up to questions. I'll pass the mic. Just raise your hand, and we have time for just a few, so try to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I heard thinking about, oh, I think that. Um, Peter Bujar was also a portraitist who was not recognized, and I was wondering, which fantastic work knew other photographers, and particularly if anyone knew if she knew Peter Bujar. That's a question. Yeah. Like I mean, just another, I mean, yeah, just another person. I think it's interesting when portraits were yeah, fashionable yeah. and didn't get recognition. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, I was thinking about like, you know, there wasn't Google then, right? There weren't you can't like find out about other artists. There's like a there's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But I mean it wasn't as fast. It, you know, maybe someone would get written up in a magazine, maybe they would have a show, but there's only so many galleries to have so many shows. It wasn't as so I, I think about all of the other self-portrait artists, um, Janice Guy among us today, who was like contemporaneously making self-portraits, and how different actually Janice's self-portraits are from Francesca's Whitman's, um, where Janice was studying um, with Struth under the uh, 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 at the Kunst Academy in Düsseldorf, uh, yeah, with the Bechers. I mean, I know I'm not saying that. Um, uh, and was making these self-portraits, also using herself as material, but in, in more of a kind of indexing, typological way, more conceptual, more like, it's just slightly, it's different, it's a, a degree removed. Or Cindy Sherman was making her work at exactly the same time, where her work, she's also, um, you know, they're, they're about stereotypes and, and roles that she's playing, or, you know, Adrian Piper's Food for the Spirit, or, um, Anna, Anna Matiana were all, like, it's amazing, like the zeitgeist of people who I, I don't think were that aware of each other. Did you know about Francesca Woodman when you were making her self portraits? Genesis, no. <laughs> no, I didn't until later when I, when I moved to Berlin. When I moved to Rome, and I moved to Rome about a year after Francesca came to New York. Oh, right. And so I never met her, but I met a lot of her friends, you know, constantly saying, you know, Francesca. 
but I didn't really see the work until quite a bit later. I just wanted to ask, just in thinking of uh, the kind of compositions of Francesca's photographs, and like thinking of portraiture, it's not like necessarily not made for photos of direct portraits and showing any form of like photographs for herself. It's a lot of gesture and kind of spiritual, kind of ghostly essences to her photographs. So I was just wondering what uh, what you thought might have influenced that, or what if, I know the surrealism would be there as well, but like in terms of what she, she was articulating by going that way rather than straight formal portraiture. It could have been, like, just thinking about the time, like, you know, even Minor White and Emma Gowan, like, the sort of, a lot of people were practicing black and white photography and kind of, you know, you could almost, I could see her kind of looking at these different people and picking things like Aaron Siskin's, you know, peeling papers things, and and also like Yvonne Rayner's dance films, like all of that stuff. I think the reason Francesca Whitman is such a kind of compelling artist is because it feels like she was filtering a lot of different um, practices into you know through her body. Really. The the, um, I'm going to give you, at the end, my copy right here of the Rosalind Cross. It has Moira's fingers on it. It's um, a collector edition um, where Rosalind Cross talks about a lot of the work was made when she was a student at RISD, and there were responses to assignments. Um, and the assignments were designed by Aaron Siskin and, you know, this kind of new Bauhaus arts education. Um, where the photographer w was tasked with certain problems of like making a picture that showed uh, a different kind of framing or depth of field or a linear or vertical composition. Um, and the beautiful way that Kress talks about this is that um, there was this idea of, of, of formal objectivity of the photograph and that was how like photographs were going to be, and even when I was a student, there's this modernist idea that what, it, what a camera does in the world is like media specific. It takes the three dimensions of the world and it flattens them into two dimensions and, you know, there's this form that happens that's inherent to the camera. Um, and so she's solving the, the problems given to her, but like doing anything but making them this kind of objective, formal. Um, she's, she's like subverting them. Um, and there's this beautiful thing that Krauss says that like, um, with, that she, she turns them personal and, personal and without the personal, there is no problem. So, you know, it, she kind of like elevates this idea of an assignment into this other arena of how, and I think that happens in the book as well, because a lot of the, um, the journals that she's putting her, her photographs into create this kind of context of juxtaposition that creates a very, formal solid brand, like there's, what's the one with the math called? The, um, uh, geometry, some uh, properties, something. Um, and the other ones are like ledgers, like a lot of them are um, these kind of indexes that, that her body doesn't fit inside of. So I don't, you know, it's not like, she's not trying to do like, you know how the camera has the flower or the mountain or the person. I don't, th <laughs> she was given other things to mm -hmm. like turn, turn to. Those three. So I don't think it was about the portrait, but I think there was this idea of like how to circumvent a certain idea of that. But it's a, a great. We have one more quick one. You can take it, but raise your hand. Speak now. There's so many smarties here today. <laughs> I mean, I I have maybe more of a comment or just like a thought because. I think that for me, as a young photography student, Woodman's work was really powerful and left a very long lasting impression. And with that was work that I was doing that felt like this kind of rite of passage that was a mimicry, but also there's all this tragedy. And so like as a woman, you also feel like the story is so emotional and tragic and you kind of have to go through that as well somehow. Like that, 
to connect, not even to connect with the work, but it's so, you feel this connection and then you also feel the tragedy. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard thing, I think, that I've always not been able to disconnect mm -hmm. from the work. The, like, the prolific artist and then the myth and the story and the tragedy of it. Um, I'm really curious about the writing, you know, it's something that I'm excited about diving into. I feel like I've looked through the book a little bit and some of it is not as legible and so I'm curious like how we can really kind of access that. Um, but there's little, they're, they're transcribed. You'll see if you spend more time with Yeah, I, I've only really briefly looked at it, but um, yeah, I just wanted to share this because this work has been incredibly important to me for as long as I've been interested in art and it's just, it's hard to, I think, this rite of passage and also the connection to like how heavy also it feels to think about her life and, and or at least the myth of like what we've been taught maybe about her life. Are, are you talking specifically about her suicide? Yeah. I think Drew should take this because he um, wrote an essay where he was talking about that, avoiding that specifically. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I, the essay I wrote a couple of years ago tried to avoid that only in part because the, what I was writing about was all student work, right? So how could you predict that? Or, I mean, obviously that's what a lot of historians or critics have done is read into work from the mid-70s, her ultimate suicide in 1981. Um, so, but I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't, I don't From Moira, um, do you remember, you're talking about the optical unconscious, it's in accidents of photography, and it's when you're talking about um, about looking, that, that uh, Walter Benjamin was looking at this photograph of the fisherman's wife who had postpartum, um, and thinking that, like, wanting to be able to foretell. Well, that, that's, that's a bit of a, <clears throat> it's, it's a slightly complicated story because he, he looks at this photograph of a woman who um, he thinks um, had postpartum depression and killed herself, but it turns out he was looking at the wrong photograph. <laughs> yeah, it was some, somebody uncovered that a little bit later. I forget which art historian it was, but it might have been um, um, who's Kaja Silverman actually might have uncovered that. He had the wrong, he had the wrong person. <laughs> but it's still like, yeah, his idea was that you could look at a photograph and see a kind of foretelling of what might happen to, to that person. Yeah, just, just by like looking at, at their face in the photograph. We're about out of time. Do you want to just say anything to close or shall we? I mean, just thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to be up here.